Google is a search engine. Uh, it allows us to search the web. And it's also a company that really focuses on innovative technologies and organizing the world's information. When we say all the world's information, we really do mean all. We've focused primarily to date on web pages, but now our efforts are expanding into things like books, um, printed materials that would be here in library, into videos, uh, into a lot of different modes and mediums that we think, where we think we can help people organize information. The internet and the World Wide Web have become part of our public and private lives. They now have over a billion users. Millions of pages of information from all over the world are available in our homes at the click of a mouse. How did it happen? Vint Cerf is one of the Internet's founders. In 2005, he started work at Google. You've been named the father of the Internet. Yes, I've been named the father of the Internet, but it's not, a, it's not accurate. Uh, Bob Kahn uh, and I did the design work in 1973. He really initiated the program at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And so it's fair to say that the two of us uh, had the primary involvement in the creation of the uh, Internet's design. But after our first paper was published in 1974, there were uh, just thousands of people involved in, in making this actually happen. Could you ever foresee at that time that the Internet would take such a flight? The technologies that we are uh, very commonly familiar with today were visible to us in the course of this work. But could we have foreseen the side effect of a billion people having access to this facility, pouring information into this? No, we couldn't see that. Uh, people began to learn very quickly how to compose information that could be put into the World Wide Web. So now the question is, how do I find it? Companies like Google and others that have found ways to index the entire Internet contribute to the utility of all that information going into the system. In the mid-1990s, many search engines were launched to help users find information on the Internet. About this time, two young men enrolled at Stanford University, Larry Page and Sergey Brin. While the internet bubble burst around them and one company after another folded, they were developing the ultimate search engine. In 1999, with a starting capital of $100,000, they founded Google. When the company went public in 2004, they became overnight billionaires. And Google, with over 6,700 employees, became the world's fastest growing internet company. Larry and Sergey, they didn't actually want to start a company. They wanted to sell their search engine technology to an existing company. And they went around to everyone and everyone said, hmm? well, our search is at least 80% as good as the next person's. Isn't that good enough? Hmm? And Larry and Sergey said, you know, no, it turns out that last 20% really does matter. And the fact that our search is noticeably better than everyone else's will make a big difference. Two students who wanted to make the best search engine. That's how Google started. But how does such a search engine work? What is behind that screen? Right, a ton of algorithms that determine what we show and when we show it. Uh, so for example, if you were to do a query on the keyword flowers, you would see that the page pulls up. Uh, one thing that's important about this, it pulls up very quickly. So that's always been um, a core thing of Google. We want to provide the best user experience. And if you have to wait for your search results a couple of seconds, that's not a good experience. So page loads very quickly. And then as you can see, we have sort of two areas on the page. We have the organic search results, which you will see on the left left hand side. And then you have all of your advertising, which you will see as uh, sometimes the top results on the page. These are clearly marked 
in a different color, and then we also have them on the right-hand side of the page. For the organic results, mm -hmm. the guy who ends up first is happiest of all, I think. Obviously. So uh, how does PageRank work? How does he get that? The way that PageRank works is it looks at incoming links into websites. Um, so essentially the idea is that if somebody has a website, say about flowers, and their website has become very, uh, has become an authority on the subject, then it's likely that other people will have links pointing to that website because they feel there's a lot of value on that website and there's something interesting there, so they make links to it. And by looking at all of these links coming in, um, we can then determine how valuable that page is. Now what we also do is we look at where did these links come from. For example, if somebody had a link from the NewYorkTimes.com to a website, then we understand that the New York Times is more respectable than maybe my personal website. So that has a bigger boost in the way that your uh, page will be ranked in the organic results. The question is, how is the choice made to rank the New York Times higher than a personal website, for instance? There are um, mechanisms that we and others use to try to assess which information is thought to be the most relevant. Uh, after all, the party who's doing the search wants information which is most relevant to the specific terms that have been used in the search query. Relevance in our world, in part, is conferred by, the, uh, by knowing how many websites are pointing to a particular place. The more that point to a place with a, a hyperlink, the more likely it is that that must be important information. So then you start ranking the importance of the places that are pointing by trying to see how, how many places point to them. Uh, it's more complicated than that, but uh, if we get too much deeper into this, it's getting into the trade secrets of Google, which I don't want to do. Uh, so we're, we're confronted with um, this huge mass of information. Uh, we try to figure out what's relevant based on these various hints. But in the end, uh, each of us has to decide for himself what our reaction is to this information. In 2005, Google had a gross turnover of 6.1 billion US dollars and a net profit of 1.5 billion. Google makes its money by advertising. So if you think about consumers, a lot of consumers around the world go to Google and type something looking for something. They get a set of natural results. At the same time, there are people who have something to offer. So if I type mobile phones, I can get a natural result based on what's popular. At the same time, there are people who want to tell the consumer, listen, I have an interesting offer or interesting thing about mobile phones. So we, on the right side of our pages, have introduced the concept of advertising, which is done in a very democratic way, that if three people, A, B, and C, want to advertise, they bid against each other how much they want to pay to be the top advertiser. Now, we, to keep the consumer's interest in mind, we also track the relevance of the advertiser and say, well, A advertised even though he paid one dollar, and B advertised because he paid, you know, 95 cents and C paid 90 cents, and it should be A, B, and C. Well, we check, when we advertise against this keyword in this fashion, A, B, and C, is A getting a lot of clicks, is B getting a lot of clicks, or is C getting a lot of clicks? If C is the most popular, most relevant ad compared to that, we actually provide a balance between money and relevance. So that's, that means a furniture maker, for instance, with a small advertising budget could compete with IKEA or... Of course. Uh, you can. If you believe you have a much better compelling proposition than somebody else, you can compete on a particular keyword by keyword basis. You don't have to buy the entire 30 seconds between the Super Bowl or the World Cup right. to be able to compete. So when I look at the Google employees, it's kind of funny because I went to school at Stanford uh, in the area. And when I joined Google, I started seeing a lot of my buddies from Stanford or people who live next door to me in the dorm rooms. 
um, or professors even. So it's really kind of a, an extension of college in many ways. There's very smart people. Um, just the types of things that we do as far as the, the cafeteria setup, the, the gyms that we have, um, and also the culture of the people and the way that they like to work and the way that they're always working. They're working hard, they're playing hard all at the same time, very similar to college. So that's kind of how I would describe it. Um, and, and the people are definitely one of the best parts of working here. Would you say uh, Google is employing the smartest people in the industry? I would think so. People now all over the world with lots of different means and methods into all kinds of jobs. Engineers, product managers, business operations, even chefs and masseuses. And we had the world puzzle champion working at Google. And we had people who really liked doing brain teasers and riddles. I've seen a photograph of a big billboard sign over a crossroad somewhere in, in mm -hmm. San Francisco. What was that all about? Well, interestingly enough, the, what happened was there was an equation where if you solved it, it gave you a series of numbers. And if you, so if you found the, that series of numbers and you typed it into an internet browser, and I think so if you did, typed it as www.thatsequenceofnumbers.com, it redirected you to the Google Jobs page. So for people who solved this cryptic riddle on the side of the road, they were then led to sort of a secret website that redirected them to Google Jobs, so then they knew and, and understood who was behind the billboard. It seems like a nice company and American business students agree. After McKinsey Management Consultants, Google is their most popular employer. But one question remains. Just how reliable is Google's search method? How watertight is it? If I look for the truth about the Holocaust, an indisputable fact, the first thing I find is Holocaust denial. Uh, whose truth are you seeing uh, when you uh, search with Google or any other engines? Google tries very, very hard to be um, uh, neutral with regard to opinion. Tries to be neutral. Tries to be neutral with regard to opinion. It doesn't, does not apply an ideology to its rank ordering. Uh, it applies algorithms to the rank ordering, but those algorithms are intended to be as objective as possible. Uh, the Google results are very much bottom up. Whatever is there, is, and Google doesn't invent anything, so it, whatever it sees is whatever people have put onto the network. We don't produce our own information. So if we take 9-11 as an example, uh, it's possible that the conspiracy theory uh, might be the most popular uh, thing. That more people are busy talking about conspiracies than they are about the official reports that come out. Uh, and if that's the case, we're back to critical thinking on the part of the recipient, the searcher, uh, who has to decide which of the many uh, uh, matches on that search that particular person cares to look at and finds the most valuable. Can a search engine be objective? Can one point of view on all information be fair? Uh, no, by definition, not. Brewster Kale lives in San Francisco. He founded the search engine company Alexa Internet, which he sold to Amazon in 1999 for $250 million worth of Amazon stock. He's the founder and director of the Internet Archive, a non-profit making organization aimed at ensuring digital information is freely available. Navigation through information is a very subjective thing. You can go and say, ah, it's all going to be some big algorithm of the sky. It's just not true. There's decisions every step in the way when you're building search engines. What to crawl, what not to crawl, what to value more than others. Um, how popularist do you make it? How much do you have it reflect what other people have done as opposed to innately? What All of these things are, are baked into a set of computer algorithms. 
could Google be, be biased if Google would want? Well, the attempt to introduce biases uh, is hard if those biases have to be algorithmically introduced for all possible information. This gets, I mean, mathematically hard. And second, I think there is a fundamental uh, belief within the Google community that uh, an unbiased result is the most important thing that we can offer to people. Let, let each of the searchers decide for themselves which is uh, of interest to them. And as I said before, uh, trying to adapt these algorithms to work well on an individual basis so that we deliver that which is most relevant to a particular party is a very important part of our philosophy. Uh, and if Google remains uh, a very popular search engine, I think it will be because it was trying to be relevant to individuals as opposed to trying to um, assert that it has somehow discovered the truth. Our company's motto, if we have one, I would say is don't be evil. It's actually a good story. When we were small, we were mostly engineers. Uh, all the employees were engineers. When we hired our first business people, some of the engineers were really concerned about would that change the way we did business, and also would it change the types of products we built. Uh, and so there was an engineer named Amit who has very neat, tidy handwriting that I refer to as Patel Sans Serif, and uh, <laughs> that's his last name. And he decided that he would go and leave a note on the board for the business people, because he knew they had a business meeting where they were going to be trying to sell some of Google's products. So unbeknownst to the business people, he wrote in the lower corner of the whiteboard, don't be evil. So in the middle of the meeting, the business people spotted it and realized it was a note <laughs> from a meet about how they, he wanted them to conduct the meetings. And uh, it just sort of stuck from that. How does that motto have a bearing on the sort of culture of the company? I think that it means that we feel that we can make money and have a successful business without sacrificing our ethics or our principles or the interests of our users. Google is now the world's most popular search engine. It has a market share of almost 60% and Google is still growing. I'm working on uh, machine translation where then uh, so the goal is to translate from uh, one human language into another human language. If right now you have um, um, uh, you want to find out something and you, you type a query in Google uh, and you might not find the answer just because uh, the, 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 uh, in, in those languages in which you perform a search and in which you can perform a search, there is just not the answer there. But there might be a Chinese web page which has exactly the thing you're looking for. Right now, you wouldn't find it. And so in order to provide basically access to information that everybody in, in, in China can access uh, the English web and, and uh, the, the German web, the French web, the Dutch web, all, the, all those texts which otherwise... Uh, are just behind a, a wall. We can significantly improve over the existing state of the art by learning from large amounts of uh, existing translations. For example, European Union has large amounts of texts which are in all official European Union languages. United Nations have texts which are in all the official United Nations languages. So it is that the computer learns basically those rules automatically from large amounts of data. That's the reason why you chose to be here? Or right, that's, uh, uh, that's one of the reasons why I chose to be here, because here for uh, this kind of uh, research, it's a place where you have uh, both the computational resources to be able to use large amounts of data and you have the large amounts of data to uh, train those systems. Okay. And uh, you have, uh, it's, it's basically part of the core mission of Google to uh, uh, organize the world's information, make it universally accessible and useful, and so machine translation is, is here an essential goal, so it's, uh, it's just perfect. Google's huge databases enable it to provide a growing number of services. The more data Google has, the higher the quality of these applications. 
But that same data contains all the information on the search behavior of Google users. How does this affect their privacy? Ian Brown is a member of the Open Rights Group, a British organization aimed at protecting private information in the digital era. I think Google's aim to make all of the public information in the world available is, is admirable and uh, I use, certainly use it many times a day myself. Uh, a lot of people on the internet do. I think they need to be much more careful about personal information. You know, I don't want all of my personal information made available to the UK government, for example. Uh, and that's why increasingly I am careful about how I use Google. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't use services like Google Mail, where they are storing um, a lot of sensitive information uh, in my email messages. Uh, and I think I'm increasingly concerned about searching for sensitive information using Google. Are you? Because I wouldn't want uh, you know, a, a lifelong record in Google's uh, vast database of, say, um, when I was younger, if I'd been interested in uh, sexually transmitted diseases, which a lot of university students are, for example, that isn't something you necessarily want to live with you for the rest of your life. me to trust you. We're clear in our privacy policy that we aren't retaining your search information because we want to say profile more about you. We're retaining the, the search information we retain we do for quality purposes. We review it only in aggregate. We do aggregate computations to try and understand how to make searches better. So for example if you search for football and click on result number three, we want to use that information so next time we take result number three and make it number one. And so we have to have some retainage in that way to, in order to better the quality of the search experience you have on Google. So I think that you know there, when you're asking questions of trust, a lot of times you're asking questions around motivation. The person that you're trusting, what are they motivated to do? And we've been pretty clear that our motivations in keeping the search information that we keep is in fact to improve end user quality. But does that require retaining it for an indefinite period of time? I mean, you could also sure. retain it for like 30 days or... Interestingly, we found that we've had some innovations that have required us to retain the information for longer than 30 days. So for example, the Google spell checker, our did you mean feature that appears on Google, has been built using long periods of, of data around you know, someone issuing a query and then issuing another corrected query right after that and us learning those corrections. And it actually takes more than 30 days worth of data to build the world-class spell corrector that we have. Google aren't being careful enough, I don't think, to um, anonymize information they store about you. They've said publicly that they do keep records of the search terms that come from your computer uh, linked to the, the internet address of your computer and potentially that can be linked back to you especially if you sign up for Google services like Gmail so I don't think it's I don't think that they can honestly say that the potential isn't there for them to uh, misuse some of this information we've seen in recent months um, that it's not just Google's decision either. Even if Google was the entirely pure company that they claim, um, you have other interested parties. For example, the US government demanded last year that Google hand over information on what people were searching for. Um, so even if, even if Google aren't abusing personal information, that doesn't stop other people coming in and trying to get access to that information. How can you take fears away that this is a big brother company? I, I guess I just don't agree and I don't think of it that way making all the world's information available. Why would one want to do that in the end? Uh, well, you can take a philosophical approach, you can take a business approach. I think uh, if you go back in history and if you look at every culture, every society, the availability of information has always 
made that society develop at a faster pace, whether it's getting them to be more innovative, whether it's getting, to be, getting them to be more informed and therefore you know, more enterprising, uh, whether it's the feeling of sort of liberation for them. So information has always had a role in people being liberated, innovative, uh, a more vibrant society. What's very fascinating is so far we've had one approach to information which is dear consumer pay attention I'm going to give you some information and if you don't log into your TV at 8 p.m. tonight you're going to miss that information forever or dear consumer pay attention tomorrow morning's newspaper is going to talk about how fantastic it is to travel to Spain well consumers are not like that we don't like to be programmed you and I want it when we want it The opportunity of our time is to have all the published works of humankind accessible to everybody. We have the technology of storage, we have the networking to be able to give distribution, and we have the political will to live in an open society. The idea of having universal access to all knowledge is within our grasp. We could build the Library of Alexandria and not just have all the great works in one place but to make it accessible to anybody all over the world. The question is, what is going to be the role of the private sphere, the companies, corporations, and the public sphere, government, libraries, universities, and the like? What's the future as we bring large amounts of information? Is it going to be largely a private enterprise or a public enterprise? That's one of the great questions of this time. Google Book Search is a historic effort to make the full text of all the world's books available and searchable through a single um, search box on Google.com. Google Book Search was really an effort to say, wow, there's all this great, really interesting information that's available in books that currently isn't searchable through Google today. So it's an effort to go and make the, all of the text, you know, books for years have been the historic vehicle through which ideas have been transmitted to make that information searchable uh, through Google. We, we've currently partnered with uh, six libraries around the world, um, one of which is, is Stanford University, and we're working closely, they're, they're our neighbors here, and we work closely with them to digitize uh, the materials in their collection uh, and make them searchable online. With this robotic uh, book scanner that we have, we can do, you know, 15 to 40,000 books a year. I would be a very, very old man before we did 9 million books at that rate. So, they, so the Google came to us with a proposition to invest heavily in this and to invest innovatively in this and to give us back uh, copies of the digital copies that they made as well as uh, not damaging the books. So uh, the public, uh, the, the private partner is the only partner that came to us with a, with a conception that was big. Um, the Internet Archive is working with about 30 libraries, also with Microsoft and Yahoo, uh, Adobe, HP, and put together an organization called the Open Content Alliance. The idea is to build an open library system where uh, different organizations pitch in to build a digitized repository of books that's open. Are you in a position to compete with Google in this? Actually, I, I'm hoping that Google turns slightly to the left and decides to join the Open Content Alliance and make their books available in the same way. Is it likely that they will? Um, there have been discussions over the last six, seven years, um, but they haven't um, proceeded yet.
We, we, Google through Google Book Search has developed a proprietary technology uh, for, di for the digitization of, of books. Mm -hmm. That is a really interesting technology in that it, it is a non-destructive technology. So we can go to these libraries that have really valuable collections uh, and scan them in a way that um, does not destroy them or damage them in any, in any shape or form. Would there be a chance for us to see how it's working? The, digi the, the digitization machinery. Uh, at, at, at this point, we're not making that available to uh, non-partners. What is the interest of Google? Uh, first, uh, I, I think that they do it because they know they will build traffic to their site. I do think they also have a philanthropic uh, point of view, an old missionary point of view. They are literally trying to do good while doing well. They're trying to do good for the public, wherever that public might be, while they're doing well in their, in their profit column. Google's just another corporation, um, and they'll take advantage of their assets to try to use it as an advantage in the commercial marketplace. That's all they are, and that's all they can be under our, our system. What guarantee do I, as a user, have that uh, Google is not going to charge me for it in the future? Well, I mean, today we, the, the Google Book Search is a service that's available to users uh, at no cost, um, as many Google services are, I think most, um, and, and this is the current plan for the product, is that we will continue to provide access to this information and to these public domain books uh, at no cost to, to our users. Books, it's who we are, it's our literature, it's what we've built up over millennia, and the idea of whether those books are going to be in the public sphere or privatized as we go through a digitization route is very much in the air. There are many uh, that say, ah, oh, it's perfectly fine if one company owns it. I I'm sure they'll, you know, make it available under reasonable licensing terms or, uh, um, but it's okay. Why, why don't we just let, let Google do it? And there are others that say, no, this is who we are. We want to be able to not have to ask permission of a, com of a company to do research with these books. If it's up to one company to say yes or no for any particular type of research, have we really won or are we living in a sort of scary Orwellian world? I think Google is getting to the size where they will have to be watched carefully by competition authorities in the US and Europe. Um, I don't think they are right now behaving uh, in a particularly monopolistic way um, with services like Google Print, for example, where they are scanning books from several very large libraries. Um, as far as I know, they haven't restricted those libraries from also supplying their books to other search engines. I think if they did start to engage in that behavior, then uh, you would want the competition authorities to step in. In the meantime, Google has been developing new applications at a furious pace on a worldwide scale. So we really expect everyone to have some element of innovation in their jobs. So when engineers are building products for our users, a lot of times they know the classic formula of what they should build, but they'll find a new flair or a new twist that they can offer. And that's really where a lot of this innovation comes from. That said, a lot of the innovation we do have comes from 20% time. And that's where we offer to our employees that they can spend 20% of their time, one day a week, doing whatever it is they feel most passionate about. That's where a lot of their excitement and joy comes from. And that's when the really good ideas get unleashed. This is a test voice clip 
sent over messenger as well as over Skype. For seven years, Sagata Mitra has been installing computers in the streets of India for both school children and street children. It's known as the Hole in the Wall project. A number of African countries, Venezuela and Argentina, have also shown interest in Dr. Mitra's project. The idea was to see if children can teach themselves how to use a computer. This is important uh, in, uh, in countries like India where there are not enough teachers and not enough schools. The results are that up to 200 children can teach themselves to use a computer using only one playground computer. And in nine months, they teach themselves enough to be able to do all the usual functions on a computer. Uh, the most common use is, of course, uh, for downloading games and music. But uh, after a few months, when they get tired of it, then they also start browsing and use Google to help them with their schoolwork, which is quite interesting. They use Google uh, to search for uh, things that uh, they have uh, read in the school and also for generally things that they are curious about. I haven't seen them use anything else other than Google. The danger to education of having only one point of view on information is that everyone will start to have just that point of view. It'll be self-reinforcing. That's not how one develops critical thinking. One develops critical thinking by contrasting, by comparing. And it's not just that individual works, but how, how are things presented. So if we were to have our school kids only use one encyclopedia, and not have any access to any other encyclopedias or any other uh, books in the library, wouldn't that be tragic? I mean, we wouldn't do that. Of course we wouldn't do that. We would want to have different points of view and you compare and you contrast. You, you go and, and open it up and go and say, okay, what did this one say? No, what did this one say? No, they're kind of different. Isn't that interesting that they're different? So it's crucial that we keep the world an open place for open publishing and making it so that people, kids, adults, ourselves, can have access through many different ways and different lenses on the same information. This is an interesting issue about what happens if there's only one, uh, one search engine which is dominant. Will its truth be the only thing that everyone pays attention to? Uh, well, one could say that same thing of, uh, of newspapers and television programs and things like that which uh, become sort of a dominant uh, influ influence on the thinking of the time. Everyone is free to build their own search engines, and in fact, uh, there have been many uh, in the history of the Internet so far. Google is, is one point in time. There may be other Googles uh, in the future. Do other search engines stand a chance? Google's market share is now so huge, it seems to have a monopoly. The company continues to develop new applications, and it's well on its way to bringing all the world's information under one roof. This may be convenient, but isn't such a monopoly dangerous? Uh, this is Google Earth. This is a application that, um, that can basically allow you to browse the entire world from outer space down to your driveway. In this case, I'm going to the Grand Canyon, and you can see all the detail all the way down into the canyon here. Over time, we're trying to get the whole world covered uh, as much as possible so that anybody can see their house and then go from where they grew up to where they went to college to where they work and be able to see that data and be able to capture that long tail of people uh, that exist in the world. Let's go over to Heathrow. And this particular area yeah, is uh, also aerial photography. 
And next you can read, there's Air France, Air Canada, there you go. So there's, uh, you can, it's pretty, some areas are that, that high detail, some more or less so, and just of varying different degrees of, of resolution. Aren't you in the end afraid that political or security issues will kind of blow up the beauty of the thing? Um, I don't know if I'm necessarily, I think, I'm not sure if fear the right word. I think that I'm hoping that, um, I don't know, I don't know if I'm just an opinion in terms of whether it's something to, it's something that we should definitely address. I think that we should definitely make sure that people, just like privacy issues, security issues, um, make sure that those are, and we talk to the right people who are very well, and sort of knowledgeable about those areas and work with them to come with the right solution. Um, I'm definitely, I mean, it's like anything that's a big thing, it's, there's always these things that you have to, you know, it's never initially a straightforward path, the, the big, big things, so. But basically what you're saying, first you have designed the technology and then you're going to see how to solve those things instead of the other way around. Um, I think that it came from a love of what it was. I mean, we saw something that was amazing and we wanted to see it happen. And, and anything that you see that, I mean, any big technology, I think that, that, is, that changes the way the world thinks and the way people perceive, perceive the world will, will cause people to, you know, to react in different ways. And this is one of those type of technologies, I think. Well, I mean, I really view us as computer scientists. So we can analyze a problem and we can solve a problem, but you know, we're not governmental officials. We're not policy makers on, on a global scale. Uh, we're simply responding to the needs of our users. With so all due respect, it sounds almost naive, mm -hmm. considering the scale on which Google works. I'm sorry, but that's my perspective. Mm -hmm. I think Google's got to such a size now and it's used by so many people that it's going to have to step very carefully to avoid accusations of Big Brother behavior. Um, however, in a couple of specific areas, I think it's already crossed that line. I think, for example, with freedom of expression, uh, what they are doing in cooperating with the Chinese government in censoring the search results they give to Chinese users is very dangerous. What they are doing in terms of storing information about their users about the kind of things that you're searching for in Google. Um, if you're using other Google services like Google Mail or Google Calendar, then they potentially have even more information about you. And I think people are rightly very concerned about how they will make use of that information. As an um, ignorant consumer, you're implicitly saying to me, trust me. I sense that you're really trying to hammer this point through about uh, trust me. Uh, could I suggest to you that uh, in the business you're in, the production of television programs, you're saying the same thing to the audience, trust me. You have every opportunity to uh, manipulate this interview and any other if you chose to do so to bias it uh, according to a particular philosophy that you have uh, and yet I'm sure you would tell me that your intent is not to do that that you're trying to get all sides of the picture in place so that the viewer gets to decide what is true and what isn't true uh, it's true in all media that there is an implicit potential for that kind of bias I think it's really important for governments and consumers to make sure that we don't ever see a situation in which a single company like Google becomes uh, a monopolist over the information out there on the internet in the world's libraries because then you do get a Ministry of Truth style situation where um, you can control and, and with technology fine-tune in a way that was never before possible the reality that is presented to users. Um, I like a, a, a phrase from a campaigner in the US called John Perry Barlow where he said censorship is the um, editing of collective human consciousness uh, and I think that, it, that explains it well. It would be very easy to um, deny information to people to manipulate their views, try to manipulate their behavior um, if you could control very 
carefully the information they had access to. We certainly already have seen the dangers of that in Europe with the mass media. That's why we have laws on media diversity. Uh, and I think we do need to be careful that we never end up in that situation on the internet.